Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Thank you very much, Manush Khanum, for this very kind and generous and elaborate introduction. Uh, let us begin by first and foremost remembering our dear and beloved friend and brother, Marhum Abul Hassan Muhtawad, who so suddenly left this temporal world to the world of eternity. He was a unique uh, human being in the sense that he had a passion for being a volunteer. You know, I've seen many volunteers, you know, in my years, but he had certain motivation that was deeply embedded within his soul with all devotion and dedication to contribute to the welfare of humanity. He understood the meaning of culture, a meaning of literature, the benefit of art, all these things were part and parcel of his personality. And that was something very appealing to me. He also understood the, you know, the, the virtue of music. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing that many of our traditional scholars, they regard music to be prohibited. He understood better that there is beauty and love and something that moves the human soul in music. So he was, he was a unique human being and they have put out a GoFundMe and I, I, I saw many generous contributors. May God bless you with his infinite blessings. And I hope all of us will contribute towards the education of his daughter. And let's recite for him al-Fatiha rahimallahu man yakra al-Fatiha. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه وخاتم أنبيائه ورسله سيدنا وشفيعنا بالقاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه المنتجبين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي اما بعد فقد قال سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وهو اصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكذلك جعلناكم امة وسطا لتكونوا شهداء على الناس ويكون الرسول عليكم شهيدا in the name of god the most kind the infinitely merciful peace mercy and blessings of god be upon us all. Before I begin the talk on the issue of religious extremism, fanaticism, zealotry, and the necessity for us to cultivate mutual appreciation, mutual coexistence with mutual respect, even if there is a differing opinion, we need to cultivate this culture of mutual reciprocity of respect and kindness. When tragic events like what happened in our recent past with the passing away of Marhum Muhtabad, many of us are left puzzled. Many of us are left with a sense of confusion, a sense of enigma. Because we know that the God that we worship is a God who is full of love and full of kindness and full of mercy a God who does not act arbitrarily. God has a particular purpose. God is not without an objective or a goal. So whatever actions that unfold in our life, there has to be inherent divine wisdom behind that particular act. And yet when we see these kind of tragic events that are so shocking, a person taken in the prime of his life in the early 50s, so a question arises in our mind that how can we reconcile these two things? A God who is all loving, a God who is all powerful, a God who is all merciful. How is that possible? Then we can have this kind of human suffering, human pain. How can we reconcile these two things? 
The God who is all powerful is able to prevent this kind of calamities, of course. A God who is so all loving is able to shower his love and prevent this kind of calamity because he is full of love. And yet we find these kind of events that unfold, which results in human pain, human suffering, even the presence of evil, you will say. How is it possible to have evil in a world that we believe is under the rulership of a God who is all loving and all kind? How, can, how is it possible to have manifestation of evil? what we are seeing around the world, evil that is done by fellow human beings. Why does God of love allow these things to happen? <clears throat> this is an issue that is unresolvable in my view. Religion, theologians, people who are in philosophy, they have tried their utmost to try to reconcile these two very contradictory things known in the literature as the puzzle of theodicy. Theodicy means that God who is so just, how is he able to allow this kind of suffering? Almost sometimes inexplicable suffering, almost senseless suffering at times. How is it possible? Let me give you a very good example. The example of slavery. The amount of pain and suffering that the African-American brothers and sisters have gone through is unfathomable. It is something that we cannot even begin to appreciate. The transatlantic slave trade was something that was so inhumane, so inexplicable. The suffering they went through, the deaths they went through during the transportation, the dehumanization they went through, the robbing of their dignity they went through. Well, African-Americans have a right to ask, where is the God of love? Where is the God of justice? And Dr. Mas'ud gave a wonderful talk about how Imam Ali was personification of justice. Well, there is also somebody above Imam Ali, the God of justice, right? The African-Americans have a right to ask, where was the, why is there absence, the void of this all loving, all powerful God who can cut off the hands of the oppressors? Well, these are difficult questions. And I don't think we have a convincing answer. All we can do is it is part of our conviction. You know, the Quran demands that we have to believe in certain things that may not have rational empirical proof. You know, we believe in things that are unseen. We haven't seen the day of judgment. We haven't seen paradise or hell. We haven't seen many things. And yet there is this particular belief system, the conviction, the spark in our heart, our conscience that says, because we are all given this divine breath and the divine breath leads us to the conclusion that there is a presence of this all loving, all kind, all just God, even though many of these things really make no sense to us, like the passing away of this dear, such kind-hearted, with a such heavenly voice, was taken away all suddenly from all of us, from his family. The question remains unanswered, and I don't think we have an answer. As I mentioned, many events have happened in this world. There's suffering going on in our own times. People who are living under this oppressive and brutal so-called many of these Muslim governments who call themselves Islamic republics. There is nothing Islamic about what they are doing, the brutality, the inhumanity, the savagery. People who are being executed, being killed, being imprisoned, being tortured, deliberately hit with point blank on their eyes, on all these other things that you know, they have a right to ask the same question. Where is the God of justice? Why are you absent? You are all present, you're observing our suffering, you're observing the inhumanity of the oppressors, 
people who are abusing and misusing your religion. Your religion is being corrupted by people who are greedy for power, who are greedy for self aggrandizement for their own vested interests or oh God. They are abusing your religion in your name and they are preventing people from embracing your faith. People are drifting away from Islam. They are drifting away from your religion of justice because of their, this kind of brutality, this kind of savagery. Where is God? Right? Where is God? Somebody who is suffering in the dungeons of these prisons where there is no mercy for men or women. People who claim we are following Imam Ali, we are following this God of justice. We are following this paragon of justice. You know, there is a book on Imam Ali written by a Christian. It's called The Voice of Human Justice, Adalatul Insaniya, the Adala of this great human being. There's a lot to be that we can question. And I don't think I have an answer. And I don't think anybody will have an answer. We are left in this zone of ultimately falling on the issue of our conviction, our belief system, our belief in the divine purpose of God, the divine wisdom of God. And we have to carry on. And there are many who can ask these questions. As I mentioned, the African-Americans, there was an African-American theologian, a religious person, who did a study of the African-American suffering. And he says, I'm a theologian, I'm a believer, but I also want to be objective. I, I, want, I, I want to try to see the history of my own brothers and sisters, what they have gone through with a sense of objectivity and a sense of fairness. And he says, if I look at this whole picture, I almost come to the conclusion that God was not interested in relieving the suffering. He asked the question, of course, we all know that he asked the question, is it possible that God could be a racist? Is it possible that our God could be a white racist who is allowing this kind of brutality and suffering to go on by the whites, the super race, as they were claiming? You know, these are difficult questions, and I don't think we have an answer. But we can learn. Even though we don't have answers, we can improve ourselves by remembering some of the grand virtues of other fellow human beings who have passed away. And one of those great human being is Imam Ali. Imam Ali was a person who was not tribalistic. That is to say his loyalty was not to any particular group, any particular tribe, because the prophet came to remove this sense of tribal solidarity. Your loyalty should be to justice. Our loyalty should not be to Shiism, it should not be to this Islamic Republic or that Islamic government. Our loyalty, our voice should represent the voice of morality, the voice of justice, the voice of ethics. If we become tribalistic and we say that, no, my loyalty is this person or this tribe or I don't know, this Ayatollah, I don't know, this doctor, whatever it may be. If this is our principle, then this principle does not harmonize with Imam Ali's motto. Imam Ali was non-tribalistic. He represented his, his loyalty to fairness, equity, and justice, wherever it may be. And he talks about this as our Dr. Masood pointed in Khutbah Sheikh Shakhiya. He's looking for justice. Even though he did not agree with the election of Caliph Uthman in the council, when it came time to see where justice reigns, Imam Ali realized that he has to go and 
try to mediate and see if he can prevent this kind of catastrophe happening against the Caliph Uthman, because that was a just act. He was not tribalistic. That yes, how come I was left on the side, I was not selected as the Caliph, and I will take my revenge on you. I will even the scores. No, that does not represent ethics. That does not represent justice and fairness. It represents self-interest. As we all are, we are so self selfish, right? Many a times we don't even like to talk about the injustices around the world. He said, why should I get involved? Why should I get involved in all these things and risk my own, risk my own future? You know, we have the most extremist right-wing government right now in Israel. People who are ruling right now with major portfolios in security and finances, they have been convicted of racism and anti-Arabism and, and terrorism, and now they're in control. And we say, why should I speak? If I speak, there's so many lobbies that can really create havoc in my life, right? They can prevent my promotion. They can create trouble for me. Huh? And yet we claim to be followers of Imam Ali. I should remain silent. Imam Ali never remained silent in the face of injustice. He could not remain silent. As you all know, when he became the caliph after 25 years, in that khutbah Sheikh Shaqiyya, Imam Ali says, that this 25 years for me was as if there was a thorn that was in my eye for 25 years. There was something stuck in my eye. And I felt that aggravation, that irritation for 25 years, but I knew where justice is and I remained, I remained quiet. This is the grandeur of this kind of personality. They go for justice, they go for what is fair. They don't go for tribal loyalty. I am affiliated with so-and-so and this and this, and I have to support this so-and-so. No, why should I speak, right? Why should I speak and, and create trouble for myself? Well, Agai Muhtabad, I think Marhum would speak. You know, we love him and we talk about his legacy. And this is where I think we need to really make a, a grand effort to make sure that it is not what we are doing, it should not be merely lip service, sloganeering, you know, shu'ar with him. Hameshema, we are very professional, we are professional sloganeers. You know, we like to give lots of slogans. Islam is like this. Our prophet is like this. Our imam is like this. Our Quran is like this. If they burn the Quran, we get so upset to the extent that, you know, we are prepared to kill and shed blood. We are prepared to break diplomatic relations because you burnt our Quran, so what? You think when they burn the Quran, they are burning the content of the Quran? The Quran is not these pieces of paper. The Quran is something that is supposed to reside in our heart. The Quran is something that has to be internalized within our behavior, within our conduct. And if you are able to internalize the Quran within, they can burn the Quran as much as they like. Doesn't make any difference. At the same time, if the Quran is in our household and is just collecting dust, and the Quran is not really representative of my behavior, it doesn't reflect how I behave, how I conduct myself, I'm an unjust human being, I'm cruel, I'm unethical, I'm immoral, then how can I claim that I'm really adoring and loving the Quran and the Prophet and Imam? This is all slogans. These are empty, hollow slogans. They have no value. We need to move from this, we need to transition. If you are going to retain our youth, our youngsters, and I think we are losing our youngsters, especially in some of these Muslim countries. 
because they see hypocrisy in us, and rightly so. They see that you make all these claims of how great your religion is and how peaceful your religion is. You know, you talk about social justice and economic justice and gender justice and environmental justice and all these slogans that you have. But they say, when we look in your behavior, in your conduct, I don't see that reflected. That does not manifest. And therefore they say, we are hypocrites. And if we have nifaq, then they say, we are turned off by this hypocrisy of yours, these empty slogans, meaningless. We don't want to follow this kind of a religion of tribalism. You don't represent justice, you represent tribal loyalty. When the prophet came, tribalism was at its peak, known as asabiya, ta'assub. You know, the prophet came to break this tribalism, tribal humanism. You know, in the tribal society, there is no right or wrong. In a tribal society, there is no moral immoral. In tribal society, whatever your tribal leader says is right, is right. Because your tribal leader said something is good and ethical and moral, it becomes ethical because your tribal leader said so, and you have loyalty to your tribe, to your tribal humanism, asabiya. If the tribal leader says something is wrong, it is wrong because he said so. We cannot independently evaluate what is morally right, morally wrong. We need to ask our tribal leader blindly what we are doing, many of us are doing in Islam. We blindly want to follow whatever somebody is saying, blindfoldedly. It is very tragic. Living in the 21st century after having gone through this era of enlightenment and reasoning and rationality, we live in a world, in a society, and yet we are prepared to follow blindly in religion, even if it is immoral. We know it doesn't make any sense. And yet we are prepared to follow it blindfoldedly. It is really very puzzling. People who are highly educated, they want to follow religion blindly. Why? You who are so intellectually sound, you have high degrees. Why are you not prepared to also reason and think when it comes to religion. The religion of Islam, the religion of Quran demands from us that we should think, we should contemplate. We have been given aql, we have been given reasoning and we are asked and demanded that you have to think. Well, we don't want to think because we are tribalistic. Tribal loyalty means you are not prepared to think. You are tribalistic. If my Shia country does something, my Shia brothers does something, just because he claims to be a Shia, I have to support him. I don't have to look for what is, what is morally good, what is morally evil. I follow him blindfoldedly because I am tribalistic. My loyalty is to my tribe. This is exactly what the prophet came to destroy. The prophet came and said, listen, morals and ethics are independent of your loyalty to human beings. You need to evaluate things on their own merits. Is this good? Is this bad? And that's why the Quran says categorically that on the day of judgment, the evaluation is not going to be tribalistic or collective. It is going to be individual. You and you alone. God says he, he is going to evaluate us based on our own individual, how we conducted ourselves individually. I cannot claim on that day, as the Quran says, some people will say, well, so-and-so, I was following so-and-so, and he misled me. You know, God, if you allow me to go back and give me some time, I'm going to change everything. I'm going to reform myself. I'm going to become a good human being, an ethical human, give me another chance. Because this guy misled me. I was following blindfoldedly 
And the Quran says, no. God says, no. Now there is a kind of a hijab. You know, the hijab that we talk about today, there is no hijab. As, you know, the Quran doesn't talk about hijab. You know, the Quranic meaning of hijab is something different. It talks about khimar, it's something else about, about the modesty. Modesty, by the way, is also for men. You know, do you think modesty is only for women, right? Somehow, women become the object of representing Islamic modesty, but men have no responsibility because men have no spiritual empowerment because men can be misled so easily, right? That's the argument. That's the argument of people like Taliban when they say women should not educate themselves. They want to argue that if women are in the public space, they are going to mislead human beings. They're going to mislead men into evil because men are so morally weak. There's the assumption that if somebody does not cover her hair, the assumption is that this particular man is going to be misled into committing sin. Oh my goodness. What a travesty to think like this about our religion. To think about our faith in this way is a real pity. It's a tragedy to think like that. But this is the way it is. That's the state of affairs. That women should be imprisoned in cages because men could be misled. This powerless, spiritually impotent men, this is not the way to the Quran portrays the responsibility of men of modesty is partnership in any event. The Quran says, no, there is now a hijab. There is a, a barrier. There is a, a veil. You can't go back. You can't change your loyalty from tribal, tribalism. You can't change your loyalty to justice now. It's over. Well, we are still living. We have an opportunity. Don't make slogans. I think, I think we, have, we have reached a stage in our, I think, evolution that I think you will agree that almost it gives halat at the there. It almost you feel like throwing up. You know, I don't know about you, but I've reached a stage in my life, probably because I'm getting older, that I'm so tired of these kind of slogans that I feel like vomiting. I want to see people to stand for justice, people who can speak the truth, people who can speak the truth to power without fearing their own you know, pushy and I don't know, this poshy position, their own particular self-interest, we need to really speak. And if we have any chance of retaining our youth, our young generation, you know, Dr. Amiri was telling me that if you look at the social justice platform that Oakland does, all this good work that they do, you will find youngsters there. Well, this is the true Islamic understanding of Islam is right there. It's all about justice. You know, if you look at the Quran, the overarching theme in the Quran after Tawheed is justice. The Quran uses many words about Adala and Qist. As a matter of fact, the Quran says, all the prophets came to be able to establish justice. And yet we are here, we see so much injustice around the world and we are almost silent for a variety of reasons. It just doesn't make any more sense. And I think it shows tribalism. And this tribalism is something the prophet came to break. And that's why the Quran says categorically that it's not tribalism. It says, Inna akramakum in the Allahi atqaqum. God says the best one of you, the best one of you is the one who has the best moral compass, atqaqum. The one who has the most sensitive understanding of human responsibility. The person with the sensi sensitive conscience, the person who has a good relationship with God. He has a very strong solidarity and bond and a conversation, a kind of a communion with God. Akramakum is this. God doesn't say about tribes. He doesn't say because you claim to be a Muslim and your name is, I don't know, Ali or Muhammad or Hassan or Abu Bakr or so on. 
this doesn't guarantee your salvation. Salvation is in our conduct, our behavior, and that's why the Quran says categorically that, yes, you have to have a sound understanding of God, but also that sound understanding has to show in how we behave with each other. And what I see among us, and not just among us, even in other faith traditions, even in our secular society. In America, for example, today, we are seeing it is very tribalistic. Your tribal loyalty is to particular political, you know, political tribe. If you are, a, I don't know, a follower of this particular, particular, you know, uh, uh, you know, political uh, party, you have to follow blindly. It doesn't make a difference whether they are fair, whether they are just, whether they are, what they are doing is really ethical. What really matters is I have to support this political party. That's tribalism. That's exactly what the prophet came to destroy. And therefore we can be living in a modern society, but we can also be at the same time experiencing jahiliya internally. It is quite possible that you could have all the gadgets, all the technology of our times. At the same time, we may be experiencing jahiliya within. It's quite possible. You know, Sayyid Qutb argued this way. I disagree with Sayyid Qutb on so many things. But on this particular issue, I, I like very much that he talks about jahiliya as a concept that can exist even in modernity. We need to look at ourselves. And I think this kind of programs, I think are programs for us to really talk about these kind of issues that are really burning issues that are relevant, how we can improve ourselves. No more talk about how great so-and-so was. Yes, the Quran is great, the prophet is great, the, the issue is how can I improve myself? How can I improve as an ethical human being? How, what can I do? Right, show me a blueprint, show me a map, show me, give me guidance. How can I become a better human being? Don't you think that should be the recipe, you know, rather than discuss about, you know, I saw in some of these, I go to Sunni and Shia gatherings and I'm, I, I'm going to conclude. You know, the, some of the issues they discuss about, I, I often wonder which planet are they living? They want to talk about issues that are really irrelevant. For example, what day should you cut your, your nails? Is it, is it mustahab to cut your nails on Wednesday or Thursday? I don't know. What day is, is mustahab to fast? I don't know. Uh, is it okay to say Merry Christmas to your Christian friends? Can you say Rosh Hashanah to your Jewish colleague? Or is it haram? Is it jaiz or haram? Do you think these are the real issues? Do you think this is a real burning issue in the Islam of our times? That can you say Merry Christmas? Can you have a Christmas tree? It's a big issue amongst these, you know, so to speak, scholars and people who are asking questions and istifta and, you know, please tell me. They don't care about all this inhumanity execution going on of, you know, people are being, blood is being shed, right? That doesn't, that doesn't concern them. What concerns them is, can you say Merry Christmas? Or is it bid'ah? Is it something that is bid'ah and we should you know, keep away from Halloween? I don't know, and all this nonsense that we talk about, really it's a tragedy. And I think this is something that I'm blaming myself, that we as, as speakers, I think we have not been careful we have not been careful in talking about issues that are really relevant and therefore you see that our youngsters are drifting away because they say you talk about issues that are really irrelevant. Doesn't make any sense to me. It makes no difference in my life. It doesn't make me a better human being. This Imam Ali was an amazing human being. He was a person who said in Najul Balagha, I, he was adopted by the prophet. He said, I would follow him like a baby camel, follows the footsteps of its mother. I used to follow the prophecy. I used to follow the prophet. I was right there when revelation came. I saw the light of revelation, he says, and the message. And I smelled the fragrance of prophecy. This was Imam Ali. He was there 
in the midst of revelation, at the same time, he understood the meaning of known extremism. You know, when he was playing extremists, as you all know, the, the Khawarij, they used to come and harass Imam Ali. When Imam Ali was leading a prayer, they would come and start reciting Quran and Imam Ali would have to pause his salat, his, his namaz, because the Quran says when somebody is reciting Quran, fastami, listen to it. And they would deliberately interrupt him. Imam Ali was patient. They would do again, he was patient. And after a while, he would just continue because he realized they are just trying to harass and bother. They used to call him names, insult him in public. They, when he would be giving a khutbah, they would curse him. And people would say to Imam Ali, shall we punish him? Imam Ali said, no, he is only insulted. It's only an insult by mouth. It is my business between me and him. You have no right to punish him. They said, okay, cut off his funding. Don't give him from Baytul Mal. These people should not receive their stipend. Imam Ali said, no, they will continue to receive their stipend. This is the Imam, and yet we are not prepared to listen to any kind of critique, any kind of criticism. But when the Khawarij began to kill innocent people, Imam Ali went to talk with them first. He talked with them at length and said, listen, what you are doing is wrong. And he explained to them rationally. Many of them came, majority came towards the camp of Imam Ali. But then there was a minority that remained stubborn. Why they were stubborn? Because they were tribalistic. Because they were blind. Their loyalty was to their tribe. And Imam Ali then had to fight them, had to confront them. And it was one of these extremists who ultimately killed and martyred Imam Ali in Kufa. But the Imam was like this. He was patient with them. He said, I can't accept extremism. You can't be fanatical. You can't have zealotry. You can't kill innocent people. If you do that, I will come for you. But if you criticize me, if you insult me, if you harass me, you are free. I'm not going to come after you. I will not cut off your funding. If you don't wear hijab, I'm not going to freeze your account. If you don't wear hijab, I'm not going to come and now fire you from your office. What kind of Islam is this? Really, it is really pathetic. It is pitiful that we need to go to this extent to force religion down people's throat. It just doesn't make any sense. Really, we need to really think about some of this very basic issue. And I want to conclude on this point. When Imam Ali sent Maliki Ashtar, you know, he, this episode of Maliki Ashtar is beautiful. And if you get a chance, you should, you should read it. Also, it was recognized in the United Nations. In one of the statements, Imam Ali says to Maliki Ashtar, when you go there, be very careful how you treat people. Just like you used to criticize them, they have a right to criticize you. Don't say, I'm the ruler. I have power. And I can do whatever I like. No, no, be very careful. You are a slave of God. I am over you and God is over me. Be very careful how you behave with your people. Don't say I'm the ruler. I have, I have this sultanate. I have this wilaya. No, be very careful. They have a right to criticize you. Just like you used to criticize those before you. And he said, Malik, when you meet people, be very careful how you treat non-Muslims. If they are non-Muslims, you have no right to discriminate against them. The Imam said there are two kinds of people. Either they are your brothers in faith or they are your equals in humanity, in creation. They are equal to you. They are not less than you. Be very careful. These are all Imam Ali's grand statements and we can go on. But I, you know, I want to see much more implementation. I think you will agree. We need to really learn to implement Imam Ali's and the prophet's virtues, the prophet's character, the Quranic values. And this will be, I think then we can celebrate truly Imam Ali's birthday. We can truly celebrate the prophet. We can truly celebrate the Quran. But if we just go around getting upset when the Quran is burned, 
Well, that's not, that's not the Islam of the Quran. And this is, hopefully, I'm also, I'm of course, talking to myself. You know, as, as we grow older, I think we get much wiser and we begin, we realize now the end is not too far. You know, you know the Imam Ali said, every breath that you take is a step towards your, towards death. We begin to, I think, become much more aware of our social responsibility, but let's begin. Let's begin the, the journey and inshallah we can, we can follow the path of this journey towards the tribe of justice, not the tribal humanism of Asabiya. And I think we can, and I have full confidence and I'm really optimistic we all can, inshallah. Wa ta'ala, thank you so very much for your patience and for your kindness. And I end here and I thank all of you for your, for your very uh, patience and sub. Thank you.